week on Q&A. Historian William Seal tells stories from his two-volume set of books on the White House. It's called The President's House, A History. William Seal, you've written 1,415 pages of material on the White House. What was the hardest part of doing that? Well, I guess the research was the hardest part, and also compressing it for that many pages, compressing this huge story. There are many things that couldn't be used or had to be dealt with in a, in a sentence or a short paragraph that I would love to have gone on and on about, but I couldn't, and it's the process of actually throwing things out, even with 1,400 pages. Well, I've got this here, two-volume set. When did you first write this? It was six, uh, the first part of it. Uh, up to President Truman's renovations of the White House 1952. This takes it, the story to the end of the first Bush administration, uh, George H.W. Bush, where, which is where the, the papers, available papers stopped at the time I wrote this. How did you approach this story? Uh, the, 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 the whole story. I mean, the whole what was story. Your, the, who are you writing it for? The central characters of the House and the various people who go there and uh, the House holds it together, and it, the various people and their reactions to living there sometimes manifest in what they do to the House, often manifest in what they don't do to the House. And uh, uh, that's the story of the presidents, the family, the staff that serve the presidents, the, the development of an institution which President Obama will enter, uh, a very well-organized institution to serve his work. And you have to look at it that way at the White House. It's work. If you had to pick a presidency, uh, and this is not a political question, more of a interesting or fun or whatever, which, which president and his family would you like to have lived with in the history? Um, that's very hard. Uh, probably Monroe. It was a very interesting time in American history. Uh, the period of Monroe and the uh, end of the War of 1812 when the United States felt at last they had really defeated Britain and um, uh, we're going into a boom situation. I think the years from uh, 1816 to 1819 would have been very exciting at the White House. What would have been like in the White House? What was James Monroe like? What was his wife like? Well, James Monroe uh, was looked a little bit like George Washington and he was considered the like a younger son to the founding fathers. He was extremely popular. Uh, he, he was uh, uh, his second election one person voted against him so that it wouldn't be unanimous and, and take the thunder away from George Washington. So he lived there. He did the White House up because he thought political parties were dead, that the nation was one, having finally defeated England and was on its own and was going to turn inward, which in fact certainly did uh, in its development for the whole century. And um, he uh, did the White House up very grandly with old Napoleonic cast-offs they bought in France, gold furniture, still in the Blue Room today. And the dish is still used in the White House today that he bought that's a president's house, always lovingly cared for. And um, he, he made his grand progresses through the country. Uh, and um, uh, seeing the various areas, visiting people, there no TV then, so they could see him. And interestingly enough, it's always, uh, as grand as the White House may get, there's always a little down to earth. Monroe, of course, didn't have enough money to do these tours. They were very expensive. So he would had some French furniture he and his wife had bought in France when he was American minister to France in the late 1790s. So he would sell that to the government and take the money and take his tours. And then when his salary of 25000 a year, which was huge then, would come in, he'd pay it back. This pattern was repeated a number of times and never known until the next administration caught on to it and it became a scandal. But his period was very vibrant. Uh, and, uh, of course, he soon learned with the Panic of 1819 that there were political parties and there was financial disaster and so on and so forth. But it was, it was a brilliant eight years. For a lot of people, at the end of this hour, we will run our 90-minute, no, it's actually longer than that, it's almost two-hour documentary that Mark Farkas has worked with you on and has produced over the last two years, roughly. I'm going to avoid asking the obvious questions that people can see in the documentary about the presidents that everybody talks about, mm -hmm. FDR, TR, Lincoln, others, many others. And I'm going to, as I read your book, I saw some great stories about some lesser-known presidents. I'm just going to pick one out. Um, Van Buren, Martin Van Buren. Uh, I'm going to quote from your book. Van Buren actively spent less than half as much 
as Andrew Johnson. Jackson. Uh, Jackson, I'm sorry. Approximately the same amount as the second Adams, John Quincy Adams, and not half as much as the first Adams, John Adams. History, nevertheless, would call him a spendthrift. It just brought up the whole issue of who spent the most money on it's the White House. All image. Uh, Van Buren lived in a much more elegant manner, and it was showy. And had a, he was from New York, self-made Manhattan uh, man, and he came down and and put on a show in the White House. The dances. The he was a bachelor, and he had bachelor sons, one of whom married there, and and uh, it was a, a show. And expense was just associated with him because he didn't. The most important thing he did to the White House was put in central heating. Which was, of course, not in many rooms, but some of the rooms. And, you know, for the first time, you could be warm on both sides. Uh, <laughs> and, the, and he did that, but otherwise, Van Buren spent very little compared to Jackson, who really did a lot. The grounds, Jackson was the father, you might say, of the grounds. And, um, and of the, finished the East Room and bought lots of furniture and things like that. What did he do for a first lady? Uh, he, his daughter, Angela, his daughter in law, Angelica Singleton. Uh, Van Buren. She was married to Abraham, the son, and was from South Carolina. And she was quite a, a character, a big, tall girl, going on the clothes that survived, many of her costumes survived. And her portrait hangs in the Red Room perpetually. And, and there's a lot of uh, different first ladies. Uh, how many of them died, actually, in and around the White House years? Well, um, I see. The first first lady, I guess, to die in the White House was who? Mrs. Tyler, in the 1840s. Uh, Mrs. Jackson was, had died just before Jackson went to the White House, and she rather looms over the story. But uh, uh, Mrs. Tyler, she was ill when she went there, and she died. And then the president, rather soon, by most standards, remarried uh, a much younger woman, a friend of his children. And had, they only had a couple of months there. But that was very lively in their time. How did John Tyler become president? Uh, by the death of William Henry Harrison, who was president only 30 days. He was the great hero of the old Northwest, and uh, he was swept into office. Actually, his election was far more of a people's common man election than Andrew Jackson's. And uh, tip, uh, Tippecanoe, old Tippecanoe was Harrison, and Tyler too, the song we all grew up with. And uh, the log cabin campaign, the, the public swarmed around this man and brought him to Washington, and he lived for 30 days and then died. Uh, his wife never even made it over the mountains to live at the White House. So Tyler took over, and uh, he proved much more of a pro project to deal with with the politicians. The politicians uh, surrounding him thought they would, as they had with Jackson, they expected to with Jackson, they thought they were going to, tell him what to do and uh, Tyler didn't agree to any of that and uh, so there was a split and Tyler actually uh, changed parties. What did his first wife die of? Uh, I suppose it was consumption. I don't know. She was very ill for a very long time and just sank and sank. I don't really know. And he was president for how long? Uh, Tyler was president for oh well almost four years just 30 days under four years. So he goes into the White House, his wife dies within how? Within about a, sure. uh, two years. And he remarries while he's in the White House? While he's there, they married in New York, but he married while he was president. A and do I remember she was 24 years old? Yes, she was, uh, 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 she was young. And how many she children had. did he have up till that point with his he first wife? Six, as I recall, and then he had about eight with her. Uh, and they were still having children at the time of the Civil War. And he was uh, uh, had quite a family. In fact, his uh, grandson was the uh, his son. I'm sorry, was the uh, uh, librarian at the College of William Mary and Mary until the oh, mid 20th century. Well, I know when we did our series back in '99 on the presidency, we interviewed, I think, the last surviving son or son, grandson, maybe the grandson, grandson, they his grandson. Yeah. But it was like because of all these children. <laughs> yes, he had lots of children, and he he figured in the. Civil War period. Uh, uh, he had quite a distinguished career, Tyler did. Millard Fillmore. Um, I read in your book that uh, the story about what happened after he left the White House and moved into the Willard. Why would you leave the White House and move to the Willard Hotel? Well, just to make way for the president. It was after the inauguration. And then, of course, Mrs. Fillmore died there at the Willard uh, that night. That first night they were gone. Uh, he was simply making way for uh, Pierce coming in.
Uh, Fillmore is one of the most misunderstood of all the presidents. He was a self-made man, as so many of them were, meaning meaning he probably came from a stable family, let's say, but, but he had nothing financially to help him along, family-wise or other. He was a surveyor, as many presidents have been. And uh, he, he, he rose a, as a lawyer and, and politician, and he and his wife, Abigail, were a very sophisticated couple. Uh, the, there are various things they did. Well, they built the first White House library, which is relatively minor. But if you read the titles of those books, as one scholar is doing today to analyze these things, they were very sophisticated. The, all the latest books on landscape and poetry and, and all of these things were in there in history uh, and so forth. But affecting us even more is the capital, the enlargement of the capital. God knows what would have happened to that building if it hadn't been for Fillmore. But he had served there, and he loved it, and they were going to expand it. And he s decreed that in no way could the same way Truman later did with the White House, and in no way could the old walls be violated. So they were adding out to the side of the Capitol, and the original dome came to looking like a half of an orange sitting up there. It was ridiculous. They needed a vertical piece for the Capitol to... Um, um, to, to to offset that long horizontal of the new wings, and of course the, this led to the decision: you couldn't put a masonry dome on there. It was going to be a dome, but you didn't have have because the state capitals had them. But you you couldn't put a heavy masonry dome on those old brick walls, and that's when they went to to iron uh, iron plates, uh, copied from uh, Saint Isaac's Cathedral in um, um, Russia, and it, it was light enough. To, to to ride those old walls. And that's really why we have the dome. It was Fillmore's idea. Fillmore brought Andrew Jackson Downing, the great landscape architect, still great in American annals of landscape, to Washington to improve things, uh, to improve the mall. He changed the original plan a lot. Uh, but it was the, that was the avant-garde thing to do uh, with in that day. And Fillmore is remembered mostly because of a, a Mencken article uh, uh, about the bathtub, who put the first bathtub in the White House? And Fillmore's always been the butt of jokes, but he was a most interesting character uh, and a, a, a sophisticated president. New Yorker. Uh, yes, upstate. And got the job how? He didn't get elected. How? Uh, he, it's the death of, uh, of Zachary Taylor, President Taylor. He, President Taylor went to a, a Fourth of July oration where George Washington Park Custis, who was Build himself as the child of Mount Vernon. He was Mrs. Washington's grandson and really uh, trafficked on the fact that he was connected to that always. He built Arlington House that we know today at Arlington Cemetery. He delivered these orations, and this particular one was four hours long. And uh, the sun was hot, and the president was old, and he went back to the White House famished and ate uh, uh, iced cherries. And they led to something and he developed pneumonia and died very quickly what did they do in the white house after his death i mean that's one of the things one of the sub themes in your book is how much death has happened in the white house oh, yeah. and what they do with it well of course in the 19th century you know death was very frequent with many a family uh, it it happened all the time illness you you know you could go out and get your feet wet uh guess is why they didn't bathe so much get your feet wet and have pneumonia and die in two days or a day it uh, happened all the time and people were very careful uh, uh, about that. But um, uh, Harrison being the first, uh, Zachary Taylor was the second to die in office. And uh, he was laid in state there and put in a receiving vault and later buried in Louisville, Kentucky. What kind of a precedent was set and, and what, what are the kind of things that almost always happen in, around death in the White House? You mean what? The response of... I mean, I noticed that a lot of people have been embalmed in the White House. Well, they all are. I mean, well, no, they're not all. But in those in the old days, they always were, just like people were embalmed at home. And uh, 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 President uh, Harrison, who died in the White House, was the first. And the uh, officials surrounding him went to uh, Darius uh, Claggett, uh, a, a owner of a large store in town, and just said, do it. And there had been state funerals at the Capitol. So Darius just went in and he draped the White House, everything. All the mirrors were covered in black crepe, the chandeliers, the um, uh, all things like that. And the president was uh, dressed in his uniform and uh, actually was in a, a winding sheet and put in the 
uh, East Room and with his dress sword from the Mexican War on top of the coffin and the, the funeral was held. Let's go back to the, this book. Um, who commissioned you to write the book in the first place? White House Historical Association. Can, non, you, non, can you remember how that started? I mean, who, who came to you and w under what circumstances? Well, I was interested in doing the book. Uh, and I, I was interested in buildings and American houses. I'd written about state capitals and things like that. So I, I got interested in the White House because it's so beautifully documented. And uh, I was doing some work for the association connected with the film. And I proposed this. And the various officials there liked the idea in that there was not a history of the White House, a, a scholarly history. Uh, and um, so that's how it started. It, it started that way. And they, uh, it was a, a commission work uh, by them. And I had absolute and utter freedom. Not one word has been dictated to me by the association at all. Now, if you published this first in uh, 1988, when did you start work on it? 86. Ten years before that. 76, yeah. I started in the late 70s on this book. So it was published in 86, and you started 10 years earlier. Yeah. Then. Well, how did you go about your research? Well, it hadn't been done before. There had been histories of the White House. The, the most important one had been published in 1909, uh, 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 two volumes, that mostly came from official reports. Fortunately, uh, the records of the White House have, most, for the most part, been maintained very carefully because an administration keeps those records because they might be criticized by the next administration for something, some little something, like Monroe. And so the National Archives has all of that, or as much as exists. In some, there are blank spots, but not much. Uh, and so I had that, and the idea was to do originally a small architectural history of the White House, which I later did after that book. But the um, it just... The association being the, the historical nonprofit organization, its sole purpose is to interpret the White House to the American people. Both they and I felt there was more to do than that. And so uh, that's the book just, just went into documents, 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 and, and to create this. And, of course, if I had been going out to try, write a something that would sell like hotcakes or, or a sensational book, I would have produced a book. Uh, rather than a history like this. It would have been 400 pages or something like that. But to really tell the story, you had to tell the story. And that's why, I'm not apologizing, but that's why it's 1,400 pages long, is it goes into all that about the White House uh, on varying levels of interest, but centered, again, in the building. Well, it, one of the things that I didn't should know, it's a narrative. It's not like it's a dry history of... Uh, oh, God, yeah. I mean, but did, did, is your, do you think, who do you think about sitting down and reading all this. You know, that's strange that you should ask history buffs, I guess, because I've always been one, though I am a historian, I've always been a history buff. And I like to think that when my time is up, that these books will exist and there'll be 10,000 term papers in them for kids in school. So I tried to write it with that in mind as well, that they could take, say, President Pierce's term and read that part of it and get a picture of life in the White House and of him, because most biographies of presidents not even very long ago, really never had anything about the White House. It was very rare. It was about the presidency, but not about life in the House. So that, that was is one of the personal motivations, is that uh, um, young people can, can get these stories, I hate to say it, but that's what they are, uh, out of the, uh, the House, the biographic, their reaction to living, that very strange situation that nobody can ever understand before they go there. You were born in Beaumont, Texas? Yes. What's the kind of the short history of Bill Seal from Beaumont, Texas to Alexandria, Virginia? Well, Beaumont, Texas was a, a curious place to become historical, but it, it, it's strange how much thinking back on it I got of a historical character. And my interest really started there. I was next to Louisiana, where I had friends who lived on a plantation near St. Francisville. I had relatives who lived in San, near uh, Taos, New Mexico, which I still love. And and then Beaumont, of course, is the home of Spindletop, the Spindletop oil boom. And there were people, still people who remembered it that I knew. And uh, all of that kind of goes together uh, in, in an interest in history. My father was interested in history as well. And, what did um, he do? Uh, he was an independent oil operator. And he, uh, that's a Texas term, I mean, he, <laughs> he accumulated leases and did drilling. But, uh, and your mother? My mother was a housewife who didn't read things I would read. Uh, 
<laughs> but anyway, she did. Uh, uh, you know, she'd read those romantic novels. But anyhow, uh, uh, it just seemed it was what I was interested in. And when did you leave there? Uh, well, I married. It. I went away to school, and then I married in '66, uh, and we lived there for two years, and then moved. Uh, began going east briefly in South Carolina. Columbia to restore some houses because I am very interested in that too historic preservation, and then we moved here in seventy one to, uh, to Alexandria, Virginia in seventy one, and now we live between East Texas in the country and Washington. Um, the school you went to, the college, Southwestern University in Georgetown, Texas, which is north of Austin. Studied what? Uh, history. <laughs> And then to um, uh, Duke University. Before we come back to this, uh, Lynn Fontaine and Alfred Lunt. I oh, mean, yes. For some in our audience, are going to go, where did that come from? <laughs> uh, and 10 Chimneys and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah. Well, I do restoration work and consulting on restoration, state capitals primarily, but also some historic house museums. I've got dear friends from all over the country buildings I've worked on like that and one of the most exciting was recently was uh, it was a three-year project was outside of Milwaukee 30 miles away it's a very interesting house which was occupied by the Broadway stars Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine and they had no children and they left the house exactly as it was she was in her late 90s when she died her false eyelashes were still on her dressing table it's the most incredible thing the clothes in the closets everything uh, just as it had been, the letters in the drawers of the desks, and a very interesting, creative man named Joseph Garton, a businessman from uh, uh, Madison, just went and bought it. He was interested in theater history, had a doctorate in theater history, though he was a businessman, and he um, and his wife bought it and just said, and they thought about it for about a year, and they asked me to come in and think about it, and it was tough. Uh, curtains were rotten. There were cobwebs everywhere, like Miss Habersham's house or something. And and but you got to thinking about it. Sure, it ought to be left exactly like this. But then that would please a few curators, but no one would else would understand it. The Lunts were very specific about what life was like. They spent every summer there, and went back to New York for the season or London. And so I recommended that it be brought back as it had been. So everything was conserved. Only rotten fabrics were replaced. Thank God they didn't have very elaborate ones. But it's brought back, it, it shines like it did in their day. We were, uh, Andrew Pinkowski took uh, layers of cigarette stain off the murals, and uh, they all smoked, of course. And um, uh, it's the scene where an old coward spent a month every summer, and uh, um, uh, uh, Vivian Lee and um, Lawrence Olivier. Uh, secretly met there during the filming of Gone with the Wind. They were going together, but he was still married. And there are all these intricacies of uh, family and people going to their latest protege was Montgomery Clift. So he was there all the time. So these people love Ten Chimneys, and it is exactly as they knew it. And the tour they've done is fascinating. It's an institution now. I noticed on the website that uh, Lynn Redgrave is going to teach next August to the, I think there are 11 fellows that are coming in. Coming in. Lynn Fontaine, Alfred Lunt. You're going to go out there and participate? Uh, uh, I don't know. I haven't been invited. But they have across the hill on the farm. It's a farm near a little town of Genesee Depot where no one would ever tell visiting people where the Lunts live. Well, I don't know. Maybe about 50 miles from here. <laughs> but because they love them. But over this hill, they have built a big center uh, for, for this sort of thing, for uh, reading, acting, studying, acting. It was always Joe, always who died, unfortunately, a few weeks after it opened. But he always wanted it to be an ongoing um, educational center, as well as the house. And the house is kept, you know, as a historical thing, and it's very unmuseumish. Well, let's go back to okay. the White House. Uh, by the way, do you have an idea <coughs> over, since 1986 how many of your books have sold through the White House Historical Association? Of the of the two volumes, yeah. around a hundred thousand. And there's a brand new one out, 2008. The, the one you have. Yeah, the, yeah. The and, and that sells for how much? $59, ninety-five, of course. That's right. And it has, it, it takes it 400, 400 extra pages additional. And then I've revised a whole lot in the earlier part that just has been a continuing life, you know, researching this stuff. I love it. And so I've, I've been able to change a number of things in the early parts of the book. What's the difference between what the White House Historical Association sells and Johns Hopkins? 
there's no difference in the content at all. And why is there two different two different publishers out of the book? Uh, two different publishers, but the uh, uh, association wanted to do a specially designed edition that Hopkins was not interested in. It's, theirs is like a, is a more scholarly presented edition, and this one is uh, more elaborate, more jazzed up. How do you buy this book? Is you it, go, are they, is it on in the stores? Web, the web? No, it's on the web. It's the way to get it. WhitehouseHistory.org is the, it'll have a whole thing on it. Uh, maybe come back to some of the writing later. We asked the Zogby polling group during the uh, campaign, in the middle of all the polling, to tack on four or five questions about the White House. And here are the results. Uh, and we asked several questions. How old were you when you, the first time you visited Washington, D.C.? And uh, we found out that 41% had never visited, but 59% had. 28% visited when they were younger than 17. 18% visited 18 to 29 years old, and 10% visited when they were 30 to 49 years old, and then 65 and older was only a percent. What does that say to you when when 28% were younger than 17 years old? You, well, that their parents took them <laughs> to see the, the national capital, yeah, the national city. Does that, well, let me go to the second question because it will, uh, uh, they're, they're, well, anyway, I'll read it. When when you think of Washington, you see which building first comes to mind as representing America. And this is not on the, yes, it is. It's 50% is the White House, 21% is the Capitol, 14% Lincoln Memorial, and then it slides down to 6% the Washington Monument, uh, Pentagon, 1%, and on. Are you surprised that the White House is 50%? Yes, because I would have thought the Capitol, because of the dome, which was such a monumental symbol before it was even finished during the Civil War. And I would have thought the U.S. Capitol would have immediately said America. And But television has intervened since the 50s, in, beginning in the 50s. And uh, it, it, the White House is an icon to the presidency, and the president is the closest point of human contact we have with our system. And I, I suppose that accounts for that. It's where the president lives. There are no beds in the Capitol that we know of. And uh, some the, the man sleeps in the White House. That's his home. And I think there's that point of... Uh, identity. Uh, and parenthetically, I don't think the White House would exist if Lincoln hadn't lived there, because I think the whole nation shared his North and South, the melodrama of his family uh, life as it fell. His family fell apart, just like other families in the nation fell apart. And people had that in their mind's eye. That's the stage set for the, all of that. And it, it always, Congress never would touch that house. Uh, the uh, question we really wanted answered was, have uh, you ever taken a tour of the White House? And it turns out that 19 percent of the Americans have toured the White House. Um, 80 percent say no, which means it depends on, you know, what age group and all that. It's between 50 and 60 million people in this country have toured the White House. Your reaction to that figure, does that make sense to you? Yes, it used to be. Uh, for years and years, it was a million, million and a half a year that went through the House. It's more restricted now. You have to go by reservation through a, con a congressman or a member of Congress. But uh, it was open. You could stand in line and go through. I've done it myself many times with friends. And uh, uh, it isn't anymore. But there were that many people. They clocked how many people went through. And uh, it, it was uh, that doesn't really surprise me. The last thing was, uh, if you are offered a tour of the White House, which of the following uh, rooms would you be most interested in seeing? Oval Office was 53 percent. And the next in the line was the private residence of the, uh, of the president. We're going to see that in the documentary later. Uh, and the Oval Office, of course. The Lincoln Bedroom was 15 percent. State Dining Room, 3. East Room, 1 percent. 1 percent for the East Room. Yeah. That, that surprises me. I, uh, TV. I would say TV for most of those because the Oval Office has assumed a presence now uh, that it didn't have, uh, and the uh, um, uh, curiosity about the fam private quarters. You immediately say, boy, I'd like to see where the president lives. And the only thing that surprises me is the East Room, because it's seen so many times, particularly since President Johnson, who began to use it a lot for press conferences and things. Here's a picture of New Hampshire's own Franklin Pierce. Oh, yes. And I want to get back to some of the stories you have in the book. Um, the story of Benjamin, Benny Pierce, uh, and Jane Pierce and what her years in the White House were like. And what years, do you remember what years he was a president? 53 to 57. 1800. So Just before the Civil War. What's the Benny story, the um, young child? Well, they had two children, uh, uh, Jane Pierce, uh, Appleton Pierce, uh, 
was a, a very quiet, intellectual woman, very smart. Uh, uh, probably a good advisor to him, as most first ladies of all, all first ladies have been. And uh, she lost a son uh, at about 10, uh, and it broke her heart, of course. Then they had this little boy that she, uh, Benny, he was about 12, as I remember, and he was idolized, of course, by her. There's a very poignant, daguerreotype image of the two of them together. And on the train, uh, a train trip after Pierce's election, there was a train wreck, and the little and the boy was thrown from the train and rolled down the hill in the snow. And President Pierce jumped out of the train and ran down to him. And when he picked him up, his cap fell off. His head had been crushed, and he died. And Mrs. Pierce took the unfortunate uh, course of saying that it was God's punishment of her of, and her husband for ambition and wanting to be president. And she was a recluse. She would write letters to the boy uh, all the years of the White House. And she just seemed doomed to problems. They were very close to Jefferson Davis and his very vivacious wife. The Davises had a little boy. And Mrs. Davis, being very pushy and very bright, took it upon herself to bring Jane Pierce out. And so she did it through the little boy. And Jane Pierce did become interested and went places and did things and then the little boy died and she went right back into where she was from which she never recovered what impact did that have on his presidency uh i don't except for a rather unhappy home life i doubt very much he was in a very tumultuous time he took the um, states rights side in the terrible kansas uh, battles uh and uh, was a represent of the old democratic uh, party uh but uh I, I coped with it uh, and had her along. She became extremely dependent, and the rest of, until she died, um, she was. Here's I, a, a quote from uh, your book. Uh, it was spoken by a woman named Agnes Meyer. Who mm -hmm. was she? Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean not our Agnes Meyer from, from Washington Post? Well, this is earlier. This is the Warren Harding uh, Agnes uh, Meyer. Oh, the, yeah. So, who said, unfortunately, I'm not the only one who thinks she is making a, a fool of herself by such incessant chatter, talking about uh, Mrs. Harding. Oh, Mrs. Harding. Oh, yes. Well, that was a pretty much an opinion in Washington, yeah, that Mrs. Harding was sort of his cultured pearl. Uh, and a lot of people made uh, jokes about her. She was rather pushy and uh, noisy. But he, he also died in the White House. I, I, if no, I counted he, right, he didn't I died in the White House. He died I mean, in the hotel in San Francisco. I mean, he died yeah. while he was president, and, and and there was lots of mystery surrounding it, of course, as there is with every president's death. And what what did they do about his funeral? It was the traditional White House funeral with little less drapery. She did not want all the mourning drapery, so there was a little bit of it in the East Room, uh, but not a lot. And then his body was taken to the Capitol, and then it was returned to Ohio. You, you talk about uh, the Oval Room on the second floor uh, and that it, it was wholly illegal what Warren Harding did on the second floor. Oh, yeah. Poker, makeshift bars, several poker parties a week, smoke pipe, cigarettes, cigars. Mm -hmm. Whiskey, plenty of whiskey. He, um, he, he, his explanation to friends was, this is my private area. I can do what I want to. I won't do that in the state parts of the house. Uh, he is the only president who did that. I mean, uh, Coolidge and Hoover were very particular in, in observing prohibition, but Harding didn't think much of it. Um, you write about somebody named Jess Smith in the Harding administration and Charles Kramer, mm -hmm. and you say that Jess Smith was ordered back to Ohio and shot himself, mm -hmm. and that Charles Kramer uh, resigned from the Veterans Bureau and committed suicide. What was that all? They were the very first that uh, were accused of corruption and graft in their federal positions. And uh, most of the Harding scandals unfolded after his death. But he knew about them. And these were close, close friends. And they were devastated and went home and uh, were very depressed. But you know, Harding said that someone asked him something once about his friends, and he said, uh, his enemies one time, and he said, it ain't my enemies that keeps me up nights, it's my friends. He says, uh, I actually wrote that quote down, I have no trouble with my enemies, I can uh, take care of my enemies all right, but my uh, damn friends, my God, I guess he said GD friends, uh -huh. uh, keep me up nights. Keep him up nights. No, but, but, Talk, talk about some of the, the uh, customs. When you start reading your book, it was very formal. 
You talk about George Washington and wouldn't shake hands with people. I mean, it all, and when did that, why was that? And when did the shake, when did they begin to shake hands with their constituents? Well, one of the big problems with the president, or challenges with the presidency is how to act, frankly, which fork to use, I guess you'd say, on simpler terms. And with Washington, of course, there had never been any heads of state before, um, but kings. And so what they did, they patterned on what George III did as John Adams had experienced it. And Washington, of course, being president, was both prime minister and head of state. So he, the, the, the president unites those two jobs. But it became honed down. It, it, it got to be almost corny uh, uh, with the, the ceremony with the men standing in the Oval uh, and all that. And when Jefferson came in, Adams followed some of that. And when Jefferson came in, the third president, he abolished all of it. Only one ceremony did he have, and that was when he stood in the center of the Blue Room and received the credential of ambassadors, which was carried on all through time until recently, and now it's in the Oval Office. But the whole issue of how a president should act and present himself to the public, the people would know when they come there how to do, how to, to do right, and not do things that are embarrassing to the presidency, goes all through. But it became very, uh, uh, Jefferson shook hands. He began that. And um, um, you go into Monroe, it becomes a little more distant. And sometimes all through history, it's a little more uh, stringent, uh, the presentation of the president, a little more distant between people who come, uh, or it'll, the whole thing will change into a very, a very great friendliness. But the dinner table is the basic unit of entertaining at the, at the White House, and always has been. Who entertained the most? Uh, Oh my goodness, your greatest numbers would be Lyndon Johnson and Jimmy Carter. <laughs> but uh, way in the past, the entertaining, well, it varied. Uh, Van Buren, Tyler, in that period, with a lot of entertaining. With Lincoln, it was arduous. He didn't enjoy it much. Anyway, he had to do it. He was so busy. But they had the state dinners. And the season in Washington, which ran from December to spring, uh, where the, everything was sort of centered around the White House. Uh, uh, parties were held. There were receptions. There was a Fourth of July reception. There was a New Year's Day reception. And then, until the 1850s, there was the uh, 8th of January, Andrew Jackson's victory at New Orleans. And those were public receptions, open to the public, and the public came. And by the 1850s, 6,000 was typical attendance. President's hands would be bruised. Uh, First Lady usually retreated behind a table or held a big bouquet to avoid it. But this was stopped in the late 20s. Uh, I just it got totally out of hand, and most people, many people who came couldn't even get in because the doors would be closed at a certain time, and there'd be a line way out on Pennsylvania Avenue. So uh, those receptions last was New Year's. Fourth of July was too hot in Washington; people began going to the shore in the 1870s, and then the last one, New Year's, lasted till 1929, and then was held once more in 32, and then no more. You mentioned uh, hot summers. Who was the first president to have air conditioning, and when did it become a central air White House? Well, to begin with, air conditioning was discovered, if you'd say, at the White House. They were trying to cool the house with uh, Garfield when he was dying. So the principle was discovered there. The first air conditioning in the White House was 1909. President Taft in the West Wing with blocks of ice in the attic. Never worked. Leaked. So they gave it up. President Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, had asthma problems, as did many of those who moved into the house of his staff, as he had his staff close at hand, many of them. And carrier company went in and put air conditioners on the chimneys with the compressors on the roof and, and blew the air through grills into certain these people's bedrooms so they could sleep at night in the heat because there was no leaving in the summer anymore. Who, who was the first president to have... A working telephone. Um, President uh, Hayes, Rutherford B. Hayes, 1879. Could and he call anybody? Were there very many people in the country that had He could phones? call the Secretary of the Treasury, and that, and and both of them could call Alexander Graham Bell. <laughs> but that's all they could call. But they liked it. When did they have a a, a wider system where it was? Oh, it, it it began to grow from then. It grew and grew. Telegraph didn't even come into the White House till after Lincoln, 1866. It had always been in another building, and you went to it and used it as a, a special thing, like people used to do fax machines, you know, go down the hall, everybody used the same one. It was the way the telegraph was. I read in your book that uh, Calvin Coolidge, uh, 
uh, lived at 15 DuPont Circle for six months outside the White House while he was president. And it, uh, how, how many times, I know in the documentary that you are very active in, our documentary that's going to be seen later, um, you talk a lot about Harry Truman and moving out and all that, but how many other presidents had to move out of the White House besides, uh, and why did Calvin Coolidge move out? He moved out because they, the, uh, they needed more space. And you have the second floor family quarters. That was all that was there, even though the offices had been moved out already because they were there until 1902. So they decided to tear the roof off and shape it in such a way that they could accommodate a third floor without your seeing it from the street. And that's what happened in 1925. And the um, Coolidge's moved to DuPont Circle, to the Patterson House, which still stands there. And there they received Lindbergh and, and all that, and then finally moved back into the house. Uh, that uh, uh, third floor was pretty bad for the house. It was done in steel and concrete, and it just mashed down. They didn't use Fillmore's rule, rule about the dome, the iron dome. They didn't do an iron third floor. They did a masonry one, and it just squashed down on the White House, which was one of the reasons the house had to be re reconstructed in 1948-52. So they left. Then, of course, Truman moved out for most of his administration. He lived in Blair House across the street while the house was being renovated. Um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, in 1902, in his 90-day wonder on the White House, did move out, finally. He said, oh, no, I can stay here. It'll be just great. And then plaster dust got him. And after a month, he moved across the street to a row house on Lafayette Square. Uh, so... It, well, of course, you've got the Coolidge's. I mean, the Clevelands, they weren't told to leave. They just left. President Cleveland uh, married his ward, a young woman, in uh, 21, and he was 47. And, and uh, he wanted her to have a normal family life. He made that very clear. He hated the press and anything. They, of course, the press was wild about her. She was called Frankie Cleveland. And he tried to hide her from all that. So he built a house out by the present Washington Cathedral uh, called Red Top. The reporters called it Red Top. And uh, they lived there just like a family, and she uh, had uh, some 30 animal pets there, and that's where they lived. They went to the White House for entertainment, and they did the same thing when, you know, he was out of uh, a term, and then he went back, was reelected in, in 93, and he went back, and uh, they had another house in Washington. They didn't stay there quite as much, but by then they had children, and then another child was born in the White House. And um, so... The Clevelands definitely lived between these other houses and the White House, but the White House was still their official residence, which it was not. It was Truman, you know, could couldn't live in the house. Got a photo from your book, and by the way, do you do you happen to know how many photos you've got in this book? One hundred and twenty, I believe. Here's a photograph of Frances Folsom Cleveland. Cleveland. You say she was twenty-one years old when they married. What, what kind of a of a I want to say sensation was that in the country when oh uh, heavens Frankie Cleveland there were Frankie Cleveland fan clubs all over the country and she went to Europe with her mother before the wedding and um, when she came back she had to be secreted through in through New York and hotels and things I mean the streets were mobbed to see Frankie Cleveland uh, she was just so popular and she was a, a very nice and interesting young woman when when uh, princess eula lee the infanta of spain came to visit in 93 she wore the famous spanish jewels which were um, pearls the size of eggs that went from her neck to the floor diamonds and all this and mrs cleveland wore a white dress with one camellia pinned on the front of it no jewelry at all and won the day she had a she had a certain likableness about her it was very popular which was nice for him because he didn't he was not much of a public figure he'd take on take on after you if you got mad about something here's a photograph of ida mckinley and the reason <laughs> i show this is because he also died in the white house not physically in the white house but he was assassinated uh, what impact did that have i mean what, what was their relationship what impact did that have uh, on the country when he was assassinated their relationship was not totally unlike that of Pierce and Mrs. Pierce. Uh, they had lost two children, two little girls, and uh, long before the White House, and Ida McKinley was a subject to depression. She also had epilepsy, uh, developed epilepsy, and um, she was a very smart, bright woman. She was the first, first first lady who ever worked on a salaried job, and she... Uh, 
uh, long before they went to the White House. And McKinley brought the country into the international world with the Spanish War and then was killed at the uh, Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt, the vice president, became president of the United States. So uh, what McKinley, McKinley created, Roosevelt dramatized with uh, the, a, a new presidency. And Mrs. McKinley lived a few years after uh, uh, McKinley, but not long. She was a very strong individual, uh, uh, but uh, an invalid, basically. This is a little bit out of context, but I, <clears throat> when I read the, the chapter on Andrew Johnson and I came across the line, 10 of his family moved into the second floor with him when he moved in after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. We don't hear much about Andrew Johnson. No. What was that family like, and why did he move 10 people to the second floor? Well, they were the most unpretentious people on earth, Andrew Johnson. His daughter, Mrs. Patterson, uh, Martha Patterson, ran things. Mrs. Uh, uh, they were unionists in the Civil War, and uh, they lived in eastern Tennessee. And Mrs. Johnson wrecked her health, taking food to the uh, Union people uh, uh, in the mountains and she was a, a very sick sickly woman and so the daughter took over management of the house and they moved the whole family in. Uh, Johnson had to wait 30, 35 days before Mrs. Lincoln would leave and he had his office over in the uh, um, treasury building which was by the way the windows were draped with the flag that had been at Ford's Theater with the gash in it from Booth's Spur which I've always thought was sort of odd. When Mrs. Lincoln left, the house was just torn to pieces. The public had gone through and whacked pieces of curtains and taken silver and everything else out of it. And it, 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 they renovated it. But the family lived there and they were the plainest people. They never had any pretenses at all about being anything grand. Uh, though Mrs. Patterson had been educated in Washington and she had known ever since the days of the Polks, she had known the White House. Uh, but they all lived there, the whole the whole bunch lived on the second floor all during the impeachment and um, uh, the president's office at one end, the family at the other. Which um, president moved the most people into the White House? I know we, you know, Doris Kearns, you did a book on ordinary, the ordinary time about the Roosevelt's having all those people on the second floor, but who else filled up the White House? Besides Franklin Roosevelt, um, well, now you've got me on that one. I don't know. <laughs> I, any I, of them? I mean, were there any of them that did more than others that had... I tend, uh, I tend to think of people like the Reagans who never did have many people there. Very seldom had anyone there. Uh, the Carters had a crowd of family there, in and out, living mostly on the third floor, and they enjoyed it, and they sunbathed on the flat area on the roof and had a good time. Um, uh, the Theodore Roosevelt's had, had many guests, but it was mostly family that was there. And uh, I, I really can't, the Roosevelt's, uh, the Franklin Roosevelt's filled the house up because he liked to have staff close at hand. And then another layer was Mrs. Roosevelt's guests, writers, people like that who came in. This picture is uh, from the Woodrow Wilson era, Dr. Grayson. Um, Carrie Grayson. That's out in front of the old executive office building. Right. Uh, what, now he had... He, he made it a difference. It made an impact. What was oh, it? Oh, yes. Carrie Grayson was a doctor, and he uh, was an, uh, an, also a, one of the great horsemen of Virginia and of anywhere. He was an incredible rider, a small man. And he, um, uh, when Woodrow Wilson's, uh, after the inauguration, there was a, a dinner, a luncheon at the White House, and one of the relatives, a woman, an older woman, fell and Dr. Grayson was one of the attached to the White House as an assistant to Dr. Rixey, who was the White House doctor. He's always a doctor assigned to the White House uh, since the late 19th century. And so um, he was so gentle with her and, and nice with her because she was in a fairly hysterical state that he was detailed to the, the uh, family, more or less, and he became intimate to, to the family uh, and became the White House doctor and was raised to the rank of admiral. And he stayed there uh, all during the Wilson administration, was intimate to the family, and no one ever knew uh, uh, the, fa the Wilsons any better than Cary Grayson. He was there when Mrs. Wilson died in the White House in 1914. Uh, he was one of the ones who introduced the new wife, Edith, to President Wilson. He was an old and dear friend of Edith's, and Edith Bowling Galt, and um, he... He just kind of knew more than anything. Then he married, 
uh, as well about the time Wilson married, and they had Altrude was his wife, and they had children, little boys. And um, uh, one of in Woodrow Wilson's time when he had the stroke, one of the children was so close to him um, that uh, Gordon, uh, who lived until recently, uh, was very close to him. Wilson would look forward to visits from him in his sickness, and he he, he pepped him up and hid cookies all over himself as when when he was so sick, and began to recover. And the little boy was attributed by the family and the doctor with being a great help. In your research, you just mentioned that somebody had died recently. How often were you able to talk to a member of the family? Uh, now and then. I have to be perfectly honest. In not having much use for White House memoirs, uh, because it is the major part of almost anyone's life, I would say anyone's life, they live there, and they so often do not jive with the facts at all about the White House and life in the White House. Because? Uh, maybe they don't remember them. Whether you get away and you make it all one panorama and drop out some details, I don't know. But that's pretty much the way it is. Very few White House memoirs have been enormously helpful. They're helpful in little ways. There's a particular good inter particularly good interview with Mrs. Kennedy, which I had never seen at the LBJ Library, by the Texas historian Joe Franz. Wonderful interview. Jack Valenti did one of the most valuable interviews I found on the Johnson administration. Uh, Wiley Buchanan, former uh, uh, director of Proto or chief of protocol, was very good. But uh, a lot of times it's just a reiteration, or it it, it it varies. So I didn't pursue those much. I talked to Margaret Truman a good deal, and she was interested in history, just like her father, and she wanted to get things right, but she got things wrong, and she admitted it. Uh, she says, I don't really remember if this is exactly the way it was. And so I could have made the whole thing memoirs and decided not to. Here's a picture of Calvin Coolidge and his two sons, uh, the story. The story, of course, is that President Harding died suddenly in California on a tour, a uh, speaking tour, and Calvin Coolidge, former governor of Massachusetts, became president of the United States. He was a totally different kind of man. You know, Harding was a glamour boy. He was uh, uh, the first president elected by women because he had an enormous appeal and beautiful voice. Uh, if you've ever, there are recordings of his voice. Coolidge was a very different sort of a man. He was very businesslike, very cryptic. And uh, just as witty as he could be. And those are his two boys. Which and, one's which? Which uh, one's John on the right? John is on the right. And, Calvin's uh, on the left? Uh, Calvin's on the left, who died in the White House. He developed a blister on the tennis court and was dead in four days of b b blood poisoning. And, uh, of course, naturally, it was a horrible thing for the family. Mrs. Coolidge uh, uh, there is, uh, was an extremely popular woman. She was a very pretty woman. Her son John uh, said that the <laughs> it was that picture represented a very quick diet because they took a good number of pounds off of her for the picture, but it became an image uh, classic to the twenties. She is the twenties matron. Uh, it is not the picture that pleased the family. They had Howard Chandler Christie, the famous uh, artist, do another picture that looked more motherly, but this one in the crimson dress. Uh, in a way named the age at the White House. Hoover, quote, uh, and, and by the way, as I said earlier, we've talked about a lot of the lesser celebrated presidents on purpose because you spend so much time on our documentary talking about the more recognizable ones, <coughs> uh, the Lincoln, the FDRs, the TRs, and the George Washingtons. Hoover, Herbert Hoover, if ever a man became president purely to serve the public, it was Herbert Clark Hoover. Those are your words. Why? Why is he more interested in serving the public than others? He was a brilliant man married to a brilliant woman. And they made together a fortune at a young age in mining. Lived in England, lived very grandly in, in England, uh, very interesting lives. When he was a great humanitarian, he fed the Belgian people in their horrible time of strife. He's still a great hero there. He was a man who could almost move mountains. He had such uh, this tremendous ability, but he was a humanitarian at heart. He didn't need to make money. And at some point in his life, early 20th century, he quit worrying about it. And he began doing what he wanted to do. And he was Secretary of Commerce. 
and uh, then became president. And they was must have been the busiest White House ever seen because the whole second floor was practically turned into a, a series of offices. And he would be meeting with people in one and she'd be meeting with people in the other. And people who met with him said a five-minute meeting with the Hoovers was a long meeting. And then in the evening, they had the staff all come up and play br uh, bridge and just literally wore people out. They were just the most energetic people. They built the first presidential uh, retreat uh, in um, the mountains, in Maryland mountains, paid for it themselves, gave it to the government. You couldn't get in there except by horseback. So it was definitely a retreat. Before I, I forget, uh -huh. we're running out of time. It, this was something that st stopped me. It's, you wrote, the, the Hoovers were sensitive in humanitarian matters, they warmly received the wives and daughters of Mormon senators and congressmen who previously had been excluded. Who ex did everybody up till Hoover's time exclude Mormons? Oh yes, Washington was very exclusive. Uh, Mormons were not accepted socially, and uh, oh, it, 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 blacks people were not. African Americans, the Hoovers did invite. Uh, African Americans to the White House. Um, uh, William De Priest from Chicago and his wife, Mrs. Hoover, had her to a tea first to warm it up, and then they had them to dinners and things. And this well, but you quoted by the President Hoover as saying, "Ladies previously tested as to their feelings." Mm -hmm. In other words, did they find out whether they would allow themselves to be in the presence of an African American? That was the pro that was the pro point with the tea. They did so they could have it, and it could be an event of record, and then after that, no problems. But that's, it's hard to imagine, but that's, I mean, the White House in democracy, but that's the way it was. What impact do you think, in our last 90 seconds, that uh, the first African-American history as President of the United States will have on the country when they see this happening uh, on January the 20th? Well, I think it's, it, in, in a way, proves the American theme of democracy, of people. It, uh, we're not perfect we're closer than anybody else. And I think in you considering President Obama when he becomes president, you've got to remember that just a part of him represents African American. The rest of him, he's very typical of presidents of the 20th century. A lawyer, self-made, uh, from pretty stable background, self-made, so forth. There were a couple live in a house they're restoring in Chicago. All of that's pretty typical. But the fact of an African American president uh, while I don't think it will make an enormous difference, uh, I, I think it does in a way prove our system, which we need to do from time to time. William Seale wrote this 1,415 page double volume history of the White House starting in 1986 and then revised it this year, 19, I mean, 2008, and this is for sale for s roughly $60 mm -hmm. Through a website that we'll have on the screen, the, the uh, White House White Historical House Association. Or. And we'll see a lot of you in the documentary, and we thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Brian. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1 877 662 7726. For free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at QA.org. QA programs are also available as C SPAN podcasts.